and Nightmare on Elm Street has long been a legacy franchise of the horror genre, acting as the birthplace of Freddy Krueger's special brand of slasher nastiness and paving the way for Wes Craven's schlocky film career in one bloody swoop. Entertaining us with nine films over 30 plus years of Freddy's antics, there are plenty of stories that come with bringing a Nightmare on Elm Street's gnarly premise to life. And from inspirational true stories to set piece disasters, the franchise has got just about everything imaginable going on behind the scenes that most audiences are none the wiser to. Every great movie has its endlessly interesting trivia, and A Nightmare on Elm Street is no different. So let's take a look at the back of the boiler room and see what secrets are lurking there, eh? I am the Dream Demon, Ash from What Culture, and these are 10 things you didn't know about A Nightmare on Elm Street. 10. A Nightmare on Elm Street was inspired by real life events. Admittedly one of the better known facts about the movie, but definitely still one of the most interesting, the knowledge that Freddy Krueger wasn't entirely a fabrication is perhaps more terrifying than the whole film franchise itself. Whilst there's no specific true story about a burned child murderer set loose on a dream rampage, there is one tragic phenomenon that inspired Wes Craven. That of a child mysteriously passing away in their sleep around the time of the movie's conception. The boy had escaped the killing fields of Cambodia with his family and made it to America, but nightmares of his past still haunted him. In an oral history of a nightmare on Elm Street for Vulture, Wes Craven describes the story as so. He told his parents he was afraid that if he slept, the thing chasing him would get him, so he tried to stay awake for days at a time. When he finally fell asleep, his parents thought his crisis was over. Then they heard screams in the middle of the night. By the time they got to him, he was dead. He died in the middle of a nightmare. Here was a youngster having a vision of a horror that everyone older was denying. That became the central line of A Nightmare on Elm Street. 9. Johnny Depp was hired because girls love him Now, this one seems pretty obvious in the aftermath of Johnny Depp's illustrious film career as professional weirdo and goth girl magnet. But it is important to remember that Depp was an unknown quantity until Craven put him on screen for the very first time in A Nightmare on Elm Street. Depp's character took off after managing to bag the role of Glenn, but it wasn't quite as simple as an audition and a win. Depp came in with his friend to speak with Craven, wanting to break into movies off the back of his time as a frontman for a rockabilly band. After meeting with the director for the part, Craven thought Depp wasn't fit for the blonde boy next door role, surprisingly enough, him arriving with greasy hair and nicotine stained fingers arguably not helping much, before taking his headshot home with the others to have a think about who he would use for the movie. Craven, ever the cinematic genius, was convinced by his teenage daughter to rewrite the role after witnessing her enthusiastic reaction to Depp, exclaiming how good-looking he was. And so, a legacy was born. Long live young Johnny Depp, eh? 8. The movie broke even in just three days Running for as long as it has, A Nightmare on Elm Street has obviously racked up some serious coin over the years. Accruing more than $630 million total, Elm Street might have had highs and lows in terms of its quality, but that golden glow of box office revenue has never dimmed over the decades Freddy has been going. And whilst this massive number is impressive all on its own, more so is that the original A Nightmare on Elm Street movie actually earned its budget back in just three days. Costing somewhere around $1.8 million to make, domestic release saw this come back to the franchise very quickly, with the movie as a whole earning a sweet $25 million over its total run. The series is the third most profitable of all the big bats, coming close behind Halloween and Friday the 13th in first place. 7. Freddy was originally supposed to stay quiet Considering just how much of a sass-mouthed asshole Freddy Krueger is, it seems almost impossible that the original iteration of the villain would be one that is absolutely silent. In the same way Barakapool from X-Men Origins Wolverine was done a dreadful disservice by having his mouth sewn shut, one Mr. Krueger was also subdued to be more in keeping with popular slashers of the time, Jason Voorhees and Michael Myers, both of which don't utter a word throughout their franchises to really hone in on that silent but deadly trope. Oh, yes, potent. In the first film, it is easy to notice how comparatively quiet he is compared to the tongue-in-cheek rascal he transforms into over the length of the series. Especially since he is only graced with less than seven minutes of screen time. Thankfully, Craven decided to toy with Freddy's sense of black humor just enough to set a precedent that the continuing films played out and built upon in excellent fashion. And the rest is history. 6. The ending was born from studio interference 
The ending of the first film that kickstarted a whole world of one-liners and dream warriors was not the one that was originally intended. No matter how badass it might be to see Freddy's grotty dream arm popping through the window and sucking Marge through to her grisly demise. In fact, Wes Craven didn't want this nightmare coda added to the end at all, and has gone as far as to say that he actually regrets letting producer Robert Shea interfere with his artistic vision. In the oral history, Craven described it in his own words. I felt that the film should end when Nancy turns her back on Freddy and its violence. Do I regret changing the ending? I do, because it's the one part of the film that isn't me. Craven wanted a wholesome ending with Freddy defeated, whereas Shea wanted Freddy to drive off in the convertible with the teens in tow. In the end, they compromised with the red and green soft top belying his influence still coming through. Though neither party have been particularly happy with the half and half deal in the years since. 5. Freddy and Elm Street are an amalgamation of bad memories. As for the big bad himself then, Freddy Krueger is a big old mixing pot of all the worst parts of Craven's fears and experiences, pulling from all sorts of distant negativity and drawing it together into one cathartic realization. The name Freddy itself is taken from an old bully that beat Craven up, whilst his hat is reminiscent of a neighborhood drunk that used to scare Craven when he was younger. Likewise, the bladed glove was inspired by Craven's fear of cat's claws alongside late night infomercials selling knife sets, and Primal Man's use of weapons to elicit fear in an audience. Even the concept of Freddy as a dream faring demon was taken from Craven's musical experience, coming from a stroke of inspiration at the hands of Gary Wright's 1976 hit Dream Weaver, which provoked the director to, uh, well, weave some dreams. Elm Street itself is another taken from real life experience too, utilized as it's one of the most popular street names in the US. Everyone has an Elm Street. Craven also referenced that he took the name from the street that JFK was assassinated on, stating that to him, it was where the innocent world ended. 4. The movie is scientifically scary. And of course, for Freddy's iconic jumper, influence was taken from a homeless man that terrified Craven by staring through his bedroom window when he was 10 years old. And also Plastic Man from DC. Yes. Freddy's jumper isn't just your average knitwear though, as whilst a vague childhood memory might have served as a starting point for Kruger's distinctive look, it certainly wasn't where Craven finished. There's a particular reason why the director decided to combine green and red as the colorway for his slasher villain. And surprisingly, it has got nothing to do with the holiday season, no matter how scary Christmas Eve shopping centers might get. In fact, the jumper is one of the few aspects of the character to be born from actual science rather than base emotional conjecture, coming to life when Craven read Scientific American and found that the human eye is rendered uncomfortable by specific shades of red and green in close proximity to each other. Apparently, our bodies struggle to recognize them when they're particularly snug. So Craven went right on ahead and slapped them on Freddy's outerwear for an extra layer of unpleasantness onto a creation that already boasts literal child murder. There is no such thing as overkill here, is there? Three. The film saved New Line Cinema from bankruptcy. A Nightmare on Elm Street's resounding commercial success that we discussed earlier wasn't just money in the bank. It's also the reason New Line Cinema has managed to stay afloat in the years since. Founded in 1967 and churning out plenty of financial failures until it finally balanced on a precipice of make or break with A Nightmare on Elm Street, it was only when the movie managed to hit it big that they could then haul themselves back into the filmmaking game. On a larger scale, that technically means we have a Nightmare on Elm Street to thank for the Lord of the Rings trilogy, since Robert Shea's gambles on movies that got New Line Cinema into a mess back then was the very same one that allowed Lord of the Rings to be financed all in one go. The studio jokingly refers to itself as the house that Freddy built in reference to his helping claw. And so they should, hey? 2. The special effects tricks didn't always go to plan When CGI effects go wrong, all it takes is a few mouse clicks to smooth them out. But that's something that really couldn't be said for one of the more ambitious set pieces in the first Nightmare movie that was achieved practically. Glenn's infamous death scene where he is sucked through his bed and turned into a geyser of blood was achieved through an upside down rotating set, in which a giant hole was created and 500 gallons of fake blood pumped through for the shining inspired take. However, when the take was first shot, the film was actually rotated the wrong way meaning thousands of dollars worth of equipment was ruined instantaneously from chaos syrup and water in what Craven dubs the Ferris wheel from hell. As for another less disastrous effect, the scene where Nancy is subdued by sticky stairs was actually created with pancake mix and oatmeal. A far more delicious way to die than what we would have seen on screen at the very least. 1. There's more than one bladed glove 
Of course, nothing is quite as memorable from the first outing of A Nightmare on Elm Street as Freddy's bladed glove. And whilst we've already learned of its inspiration, the creation of the infamous instrument was just as terrifying. There's at least three iterations of the bladed glove used throughout the movie, with one made of rubber, one made of balsa wood, and one that is the real deal that can actually cut through things, or people, should you get the urge. The real glove was called the Hero Glove, and was so heavy it made Robert England's shoulder droop, which was incorporated into Freddy's final look. The fish blades on the glove were so sharp that it injured almost everyone who wore it, and wouldn't allow for a closed fist, otherwise the blades would go into the wearer's arms. And as an aside, the first time we actually see the glove and Freddy Krueger himself is Charles Ballardinelli instead of Robert England, since he was the only one with the practical effects skill set to put the glove together on screen. In contrast, Robert England cut himself the very first time he put it on. And that's our list. What other trivia belongs on this list? Share your thoughts in the comments section below. I've been Ash and this has been What Culture. Don't forget to like, share, subscribe, and come back again for more facts and film stuff that we put out every day. I hope you like it. Thanks for watching. Bye.